I think this is a good exercise for us. I feel real good about it. I want to take some more time with it. Uh, because if we can uh, get in, in the habit of thinking about the rules of interpretation, we're all going to be stronger and better disciples. I think there's a huge crisis in the church today with bad interpretation. And I think that we have a responsibility to be good, solid interpreters of God's Word for ourselves and, and to help others. So let's spend some more time on this, uh, and I hope, hope you find it helpful. Uh, turn to the side of the card that says Rules of Interpretation. Let me, let me just read through those again. The context is crucial. Scripture can't contradict Scripture. A word can have different meanings. Scripture interprets Scripture. The Gospel of John is the foundation. And salvation is distinct from discipleship. And what we began last week was to use these roles in a particular passage. We didn't finish. I, I really think we just kind of got started. But it's uh, a classic passage that is, I don't know, it's probably as misinterpreted as any passage in the Bible. Uh, James chapter 2. So let's turn back to James chapter 2. And let's uh, keep looking at this. Uh, verse four, starting in verse 14, James 2, starting in verse 14. What does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can faith save him? Yeah. Brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you says to them, Depart in peace, be warm and filled, but you do not give them the things which are needed for the body, what does it profit? Thus also, by itself, thus also faith, by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. What's the common or popular interpretation of this passage? Salvation is by faith plus work. So if you don't have works, what would be the conclusion of it? You're not saved. Either you never had it, or or you lost it. This is just a widespread uh, interpretation of uh, this passage. I want to especially zero in on uh, verse 14. What does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can faith uh, save him? Now, what uh, rules of Interpretation do we especially need for verse 14? Scripture, scripture can't contradict Scripture. And we're going to consider that. What else? Word can have different meanings. Context is crucial. All, always context is crucial. I mean, that, that rule will apply to every passage you look at. This one especially, Scripture can't contradict Scripture, right? A, a word can have different meanings. Okay, a word can have different meanings, and what word or words in here was especially, do we especially need to think about that rule? Brothers and sisters. Mark? Brothers and sisters. Say. Say. Uh, well, brothers wouldn't have different meanings. Okay? You're right. That would more apply to context, I think. But I, what Stevie brought up is very important. The word brethren is very important here. Okay, uh, what, what word... Do we have to think a word could have different meaning? Save. Save. Because when you read save, you always need to ask what? Save from what? And uh, we read the word save, we should instinctively think save from what? And the reason is, you in this case, well, the popular interpretation says that saved here means what? Safe from hell. Safe from hell. 
And we need to think, well, is that what the word save means in this context? We're going to talk about that. What other word um, in here could have it? Faith. 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 Well, tell me what you have in mind. Faith for what? Now, Josh, help me a few weeks ago. You all were here, if you were here. The word faith means faith. What, what I mean by it can have different meanings. It can have uh, different meanings in context. And you've already implied it in your question. Faith for what? Saved from what? The popular interpretation of faith in this passage is what? Saving faith. Saving faith. Faith to get to heaven. Uh, but we're going to see that faith doesn't always talk. Well, the word faith isn't always referring to <coughs> faith for salvation or, etern or eternal uh, life. All right. Um, any other rules of interpretation that we'd especially need to remember about verse 14? Okay. I think salvation is distinct from discipleship applies. Okay. Because we have to think about what? About this verse. Yeah. Um, is James speaking to discipleship? Yes. Is James talking about eternal salvation, or is he talking about discipleship? Uh, we're going to see, too, uh, if we get to it today, Scripture interprets Scripture, because other Scripture can help us interpret something in here that's very important. Okay. So let's uh, think about context, and some of this is review from last week. Anything... That, what, what, you remember anything from last week about context that was crucial? Who's he speaking to? Who's he speaking to in the context? And uh, Stevie already pointed it out. There's a key word in here that tells us who he's speaking to. Brethren. Yeah, that would be a very strange word to use if he's questioning people's salvation. He's affirming their uh, eternal salvation. And last week we looked at a few places where he uses the word brethren. And I thought, you know, I want to, I'm going to look look and see how many times does he use the word brethren, because I didn't do this last week. And I think this is pretty powerful, so if you'll just bear with me, I want to show you how many times in ways, or context, in the book, in the letter that he uses the word brethren. So, Let's, let's go through this real quick. Go back to verse chapter 1, verse 2. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. Verse 16. Do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. Verse 19. So then, my beloved brethren, Brethren, let everyone be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. Chapter 2, verse 1. My brethren, do not hold the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with partiality. Verse 5. Listen, my beloved brethren, has God not chosen the poor of this world to be rich in faith? Uh, verse 14. What does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Chapter 3, verse 1. My brethren, let not many of you become teachers. Chapter, or verse 10. Out of the same mouth proceed blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not to be so. Verse 12. Can a fig tree, my brethren, bear olives, or a grapevine bear figs? Chapter 4, verse 11. Do not speak evil of one another, brethren. Chapter 5, verse 7. Therefore be patient, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. Verse 9. 
Do not grumble against one another, brethren, lest you be condemned. Verse 10. My brethren, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord as an example of suffering and patience. Verse 12. Above all, my beloved brethren, or above all, my brethren, do not swear either by heaven or by earth or by with any other oath. And verse 19, brethren, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone turns him back, let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his way will save his soul from death and cover a multitude of sins. So, what's your impression? What impression do you get as well from what I just... Uh, he made a big point to let everybody who reads it know who he was talking to. <laughs> yeah, and, and I, I wanted to go through that because it's like, oh, it's kind of like he's, he's knocking us over with the truth that he's writing to believers. He's not... Is he... Do you get the feeling if he uses that word, brethren, 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 that he's wondering... If, if they're saved, what what is it? What is his thought about their? Yeah, they're born again, brethren, beloved brethren, and they need to grow as disciples. So, in this case, the context of the whole letter is crucial, and I think that's often overlooked. He is not writing to challenge or question the salvation the eternal salvation of his reader. Far from it. He's affirming that he's writing to those that are that have eternal lives. Alright? Anything else that we saw in context last week that was helpful? And it's not really in, even in the context, it's right in the verse. I want to repeat it because it was such a good point. Verse 14. What does it profit, my brethren? What's significant about the word profit? Yeah. Yeah. Gain for brethren. The brethren need to gain or profit. That's what he's writing about. He's not talking about eternal life. He's talking about how to gain profit, not financially, but spiritual profit in your daily life. I didn't notice it until uh, yesterday, but the word profit is used again down at the end of verse uh, 16. What does it profit? Uh, so he uses it twice. So he's trying to help believers to be profitable, spiritually profitable in their daily lives. Not questioning their eternal salvation, but questioning whether they're profiting in their daily life, growing in their uh, daily life. All right, now we need to think about the word faith because as it was brought up this is this is crucial oh well we need to think about a number of things here the scripture can't contradict scripture and words have different meanings okay so what i want to do is focus on the word faith and saved and think about how those words are used in other scripture and I think there's a classic passage that we need to turn to, and that's Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. So let's turn to Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. And then we're going to think about it in light of James 2. Most of you are very familiar with Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. So, uh, but... The exercise right now is to compare it with James 2. Okay, Ephesians 2 8. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it's the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should uh, boast. Okay, let's think about the word saved. In Ephesians 2 8 and 9. Saved from what? How do you know? He's reminding him what's already happened. 
Yes. Have, have been saved. Right? Uh, what else is the clue that he's talking about safe from hell? It's a gift of God. It's a gift of God. It's not of works. I mean, obviously, Paul is writing here, he's using the word safe of safe from hell. Now, how about the word faith? For by grace you've been saved through faith. The question is faith for what? Salvation. salvation. It's faith for salvation. And he doesn't get into it, but faith, what does he mean by faith? I mean, how do you, what faith do you need to have to be saved eternally? Yeah, faith in Jesus for everlasting life. That's clear in other passages. So, what we have here is faith for eternal life, saved from hell, and not of works. And unfortunately, uh, when people go to James, they tend to think in the same uh, framework. Well, James must be talking about saved from hell. James must be talking about faith for eternal life. Right? James must be talking about works like Paul's talking about works. And when, but then when we look at James 2, there's, if we try to make the terminology the same as Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, or the meaning the same as uh, Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, what? You have a huge what, contradiction. Yeah, you have a huge contradiction. And what rule of interpretation needs to be applied? And not Scripture can't contradict Scripture. So, James can't contradict Paul. Because Scripture can't contradict Scripture. So when we go back to James 2, what, again, I'm repeating, what question do we need to ask about faith? No, faith. What kind of faith? Yeah, faith for what? And what question do we need to ask about saved? From saved from what? For uh, in, in uh, Ephesians 2, it was saved from faith for eternal life and saved from hell. But I want to suggest that James is talking about faith, a different faith. So if it's not faith for eternal life, what would it be? Faith. Yeah, faith in daily life. Do you need faith in your daily life? <laughs> okay, it's not, but and and uh, let me let me ask this: uh, faith. What's the difference between faith in daily life and faith for eternal life? What are what what, what might be ongoing in one's life? Okay, faith for eternal life happens when in in the moment you believe, the split second that you're convinced that it's true. One and done. One and done. Yeah, one, that's a good way to put it. How about faith for daily life? It's a practice that you do every day. Every day you every need faith moment. in your daily uh, life. I didn't turn to it, but in 2 Corinthians 5, Paul says, we walk by faith. I like that. We walk by faith. So... I want, I want us to look and see how James uses faith in, in the uh, epistle to just kind of underscore uh, what James is, uh, has in mind by faith in this letter. So let's go back to chapter 1, verse 3. Well, let's read 2 and 3. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. Is, that, is he talking about faith for eternal life or faith in daily life? Yeah. How do you know? Patience. Patience, yeah. yeah it, the outcome is patience. He's not talking about the outcome being eternal life. 
Testing. Testing. Yes. Testing of your faith. Yes. Phil. Phil. Um, my, my Bible says perseverance, and it seems that uh, that is uh, patience is something you wait for, you're waiting. Perseverance is something that you're actively doing. So, uh, obviously, there are synonymous because you can't have scripture contradicting scripture, no matter if the wording is here for you. Yeah. I like what you're saying because this is talking about an ongoing growth process, not a moment of. And you don't get a ton of patience right away. Yeah. <laughs> right. All right. Here's another one, verse 6. Uh, well, we really need verse 5. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all liberally and, and without reproach, and it will be given to him. But let him ask in what? Faith. Faith. Without, with no doubting, for he who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. Faith for daily life or faith for eternal life? Yeah, it's obvious here. This is when you pray, you need to ask in faith. That's um, How often do you need to have faith when you pray? Every day, every time, ongoing. It's not talking about faith for eternal life. It's talking about faith for daily life. And faith for wisdom. Specifically. In contrast to? Faith in Christ to do what he says he's going to do and give us everlasting life. Yes, thank you. Okay? This is so powerful, it, it, I want it to be powerful, and so redundant, and so obvious. So I'm, I'm going to beat this, because I, I, I want us to see how important it is to follow the rules of interpretation, and then the interpretation in chapter 2 is not, it's like, why did anybody even have a question about this? So let's keep going. <coughs> chapter 2, verse uh, 5. Listen, my beloved brethren, has God not chosen the poor of this world to be rich in what? Faith. Faith. And heirs of the kingdom which he promised to those who love him? Faith for eternal life or faith for daily life? Why? Okay. Okay. How about the phrase rich in faith? What's that imply? Dependence. A magnitude of faith. Yeah. A measure of faith. A measure of faith. A growing faith. It's not a, it's not a binary. It's not, it's not a, nothing or something. It's, it's a measure, a scale. Yeah. And is this something that occurs one time or occurs or needs to occur in an ongoing way. Ongoing way. It grows. Yeah. To be rich in faith. It implies dependence. Yes. Trusting in God to help us. When? Every day. Every day. Okay, one more. Uh, chapter 5, verse 15. This one's kind of interesting in light of uh, what we're talking about. Well, well, we'll start in verse 14. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the sick and the Lord will raise him up. Okay. There you have the word faith. Is this faith for eternal life? Or is it faith in daily well in this it's an incident in in daily life? Why is it not faith for eternal life? Right? <coughs> it's prayer, right? It's prayer for what? Someone that's sick, believing that God's going to answer prayer, right? 
I mean, obviously, this has nothing to do with believing in Jesus for eternal life. It's faith for something that occurs in daily life. And uh, I want us to see that this is, this is what James's emphasis is when he talks about faith, is faith for daily uh, life. This is not, this is not uh, for a health issue. This is for a spiritual issue. Well, am I correct? No, it's 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 somebody sick, so it's a health problem. But it could it could have spiritual implications. But it's still not faith for uh, eternal life. Okay, so we've answer, I hope we've answered the question. Is James talking about faith for eternal life or faith for daily life? Daily uh, life. And when you go back to uh, 2.14, it, it, it looks self-evident. I think it should. Uh, what does it profit, my brethren, Christians, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Faith for daily life. Faith in your daily life. But... That leads to the question that James raises, can faith save him? Now that's an even harder word, I think, for, uh, that people stumble over when it comes to interpreting James 2. Uh, and the question is, saved from what? Uh, and the popular common answer is saved from hell. So let's, let's consider what we need to consider about the word saved um, in James, first of all, and then maybe go outside of James, as we will in a moment. So I think it would be good to look to see how James uses the word saved elsewhere in the letter. So uh, turn over to chapter 5, uh, verse 15 again. <coughs> I just read it. Verse 15, the prayer of faith will save the sick and the Lord will raise him up. What does save mean here? Save from sickness. Even. Save from sickness. In the context, it's save from what? Save from sickness or save from death that sickness could lead to. This one seems pretty simple. Yeah, but if I pray, then am I not supposed to get well? I mean, that's, that's when people talk to me about that. Look right here, it says, the prayer of faith will save the sick. So apparently he didn't have enough faith that the sick person died. Yeah. Okay. And I mean, that's how to get strong in my faith. Yeah, and I, right now, and, and rightly so, Matt, you're leading us down to what does this verse mean? And I don't, you know, it's a hard verse as far as what is the prayer of faith and, and all. But I want to keep it on the level is what what is saved mean here? Is this mean that the sick person is going to be saved from hell? No. Oh my goodness. Please don't ever. I mean, how could we possibly think the person's sick calls for the elders to pray for him. The elders pray for him and he gets saved eternally. It means saved from sickness, saved from death. To, to, and to briefly comment on your question, it's a prayer that God hears. It's a prayer of faith that God chose to answer. He will answer. Yeah. And the faith is that he will answer however it goes. Right. And uh, it's talking about by the way, it's talking about the faith of whom? Who, who needs to have faith here? Well, the elders. Yeah, the bread throne. Yeah, well, the elders. Because the sick person calls for the elders. The elders pray for him. Uh, it's important for the elders to have faith. That God hears their prayer. And that God will answer according to his will. And many times God does answer prayer of elders for sick people. And that when that prayer is answered, the sick person is saved from his sickness or possible death. So that's what's going on here. 
But the point is that saved here is certainly not talking about saved from hell. It's far from what James has in mind in this particular um, context. Make sense? Question? Okay, look at uh, verse, uh, I think it's 19 and 20. The last two verses. Brethren, if anyone among you wanders from the truth, I'm going to stop right there. Who might wander from the truth? A believer. Yeah, brethren, if any of you, brethren, wanders from the truth and someone turns him back, let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his way will save a soul from death and cover a multitude of sins. Now this opens up a whole new realm of of we need to interpret what this means. But I turned here to talk about the word saved. Okay? So in this context, saved from what? Well, what's not, so not give me the get, what term? What term in the text? Say from what? Death of the fellowship with God. Well, the truth. Okay, death. That's the key word, right? Saved from death. Let me. Let me he who turns a sinner. What sinner? What? A believing a sinner. sinner. A, 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 a born again. A bread. A brother that wanders from the truth. And someone turns him back to the truth. And when he turns him back from the error of his way, he saves a soul from death. Who is who gets saved here? A person that already has eternal life. He says, brethren, if any of you brethren, that have eternal life uh, wander from the truth. What would that, what could that imply, wander from the truth? Fall away from fellowship. Yeah, fall away from fellowship with God. It could imply fall away in terms of their beliefs and their actions. Either, either one. The, the truth of what God has told them to believe and do, and they fall away from it. They get out of fellowship with God. And someone... A believer turns him back to what? Faith. Faith. Truth. Fellowship. Uh, he's turned a sinner. What kind of sinner? A believing sinner. A born again sinner. From the error of his way. And saved a soul from death. What's the death there? What death? So now we're now we're into our rule of interpretation. <clears throat> My version says life from huh? death. My version says life from death. Saved his life from death. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, how many of you have soul? Save a soul. How many of you have save a life? Just yours? Okay. It's the uh, it's the word suke, and it's tr it, some places it's translated soul, some traces it's some places translated life. Same word. It's the same word. In the Greek, you mean it's the same word. In the Greek, it's the same word. English translators sometimes choose to, to translate it soul. Sometimes they choose to translate it life. And I'm glad you brought it up because it helps. Because well, I was we wondering why you guys were so confused. Yeah, this could easily be translated life, save a life from death. Just a wandering soul. Okay. Uh, yeah, that's the translator got uh, creative <laughs> to try to get the emotion there. Okay. So what could he mean by death? <clears throat> yeah. Physical death. Yeah. Let me ask you this. In, in what way can a born again Christian die? 
with his physical death. Yeah. Could he be talking about that here? Could be. Why? He could actually lose his life. He could die because of the sins that he's engaged in or whatever right. he's wandered off. It could be detrimental. It actually cost him his life. Yeah. Do we see that in other scriptures? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. There are scriptures that warn that you could die. Sleep early. God could take your life. Christian. <laughs> Born again believer. God could take your life. If you keep down this path, God could take your life. And he did that a number of times in scripture. Okay, what's another way that a born-again believer can die? It's already been said, I think. But fellowship with, with the Lord. Lord. Yeah. Fellowship. Your, fe your fellowship with God can die. A, uh, not an eternal death, but a, 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 a relationship a death. death. A relationship death. Yeah. Like uh, somebody is married, and they might not say it, but they're thinking it, you know, our, our, our marriage is dead. Well, we're not talking about, you know, hell. They're not talking about physical death. But they're talking about the relationship has died. They still married and they still have a relationship, but it's not alive. <coughs> if I could use that as an illustration. And in the same way, and Paul talks about this in Romans 8. How if we set our mind on the things of the flesh, we die. Now Paul wasn't saying we die eternally, but he is saying our, vit our the vitality of our Christian life died. And that's what, I'm certain that's what James has in mind here. Either physical death or f a fellowship death. Josh. So in Lord's Supper, we're talking about First Peter. He talks about saving the soul. Yeah. Maybe, maybe it's similar here. If, you, if soul is used when we're talking about, um, I mean, Peter talks. That's written to believers also. That's the same Greek word. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and we're going to turn to another passage in James that underscores the saving of the soul. And by the way, this is this just this leads to one thing after another. When we uh, talk. We've been conditioned, I think, I have. When you talk about saving souls, I grew up in a tradition where you talk about so saving souls. What is the common understanding of what that means? Yeah, saving souls from hell. And that's okay to talk like that. I'm not, I'm not saying that's wrong to talk about saving souls from hell, to talking about life, saving lives from hell. But we need to understand that the scriptures don't necessarily always use the term soul as uh, an eternal life term. Because the word soul just means life. Let, let me, this opens up more of what we need to look at in James. Turn back to uh, chapter 1. Um, I'm going to start at verse 19. So then, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. For the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. So who's he writing to? Believers. Yeah, believers, brethren. And what's he warning of here? What's he warning believers about? Talking too much and not listening enough. Yeah, not getting angry, right? Uh, is he talking about their eternal destiny in this passage? No, no. Keep that in mind because in the next verse, therefore, and when you read the word therefore, what do you mean? What's that there for? What's it there for? Was to tie, is to continue or tie in what he's going to say next with what he just said. Therefore, 
lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness. Who needs to do that? Believers. Believers. Is he telling unbelievers? No. no. Lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word. Well, let's stop there. What's that mean? Receive the implanted word. Think about it. What's the, what's the word? The construction from the scriptures. It's the scripture. The word, yeah. What's implanted implied? Revealed. It's already been planted in you. The seed of the word of God was planted in you. When? The moment you believe. The moment you believe. When you believe John 3.16... Or Ephesians 2, 8, 9, or whatever passage. That word was implanted in you. The seed of the word of God. You were born again by the word of God. The seed of the word of God was implanted in you. You instinctively have the, the, the seed of the word of God implanted in you. And now you need to receive the implanted word. What would that imply? Embrace it. Embrace it. Embrace it. Keep taking it in. Keep receiving the word that was implanted. You know, when you're born again, that was the first uh, dose of the word of God. Keep receiving more of the word of God. And then, then look what he says. Which is able to save your souls. Ah. Is he talking about Saved from hell. No. No. Why? They're brethren. The word's been implanted. Uh, if he meant save your souls from hell, then what would you have to do in verse 21 to save your soul from hell? You'd have to lay aside filthiness and wickedness. So what would that imply? Works. Works. So what he would be saying is, brethren, you that have eternal life, you'd better keep laying aside filthiness and wickedness, or you're not going to make it to heaven. How do you feel about that? You like that interpretation? I hope you hate it, because that's work salvation. And how would you, how would you ever know? How would you ever know? <clears throat> Could you have could you have assurance? No. Why not? Because I got angry yesterday. How much did I lay aside? Because you got angry yesterday. <laughs> did, I, did I miss something? What is that? So uh, the word soul, does anybody have life? I, I bet you do. Do you have life? Um, I'm pretty embarrassed about my translation on this one. It says, which is able to save you and completely omits. Life or soul. That's a translator that was trying to dodge controversy. That's a translator that said, "I'm not. I'm gonna. My translation won't be controversial. I'm just gonna try to save you." Well, that was. That didn't figure it out. Yeah, uh, uh, that wasn't a very good job translating because there's a word there that needs to be translated. It's the word suke. And suke, what is, do you remember what a suke can life. mean? What? Life. Soul or life. It's translated either way. So, the translator, with all due respect, he didn't do a very good job on that verse. So, you should be embarrassed by your translation. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, uh, does anybody have life there? Save your life. Life. Nobody has it. I have it in the bottom part of my Bible. It talks about life. There's a footnote uh -huh. that says, or life, or lives, save your lives. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So again, we're conditioned when we read the word soul from maybe sermons that we've heard growing up, you know, saving souls. But soul just means life. So what what do you think he means by if you, if you as a Christian lay aside filthiness and wickedness and take in the impl more of the implanted word of God, make it a part of your life, uh, God's going to save your life from what? Being unfaithful. 
being unprofitable. That's a good word because that's what he uses later. Yeah. Could be wrath too, could it? It could be God's wrath. It could be physical death. Yes. And what was the other death that we talked about? Death of fellowship. Fellowship. Yeah. If if you is it true? If you today lay aside filthiness and wickedness, you really seek to walk with God, and you're really trying to take live by the Word of God, will God save your life from damage? Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. He'll, he'll save your life from loss of fellowship. He'll save your life from being unprofitable. It'll be a good day. God will save you today from the damage of sin and the consequences of sin. All right, so what we've done is say that when we interpret James 2, uh, 14, we, we need to ask about the word faith. What's the question? Faith for what? Faith for what? And what's the answer in James 2? Daily life. We need to answer safe from what? And uh, what's the answer? There's, there could be many answers here. Safe from an unprofitable life. Thank you. Bob, is there a more specific answer to the faith for what in James 2? If we say daily life, and that's pretty broad. Like, for example, in James 1, we have, he wants us to have faith for wisdom. Yeah. Specifically. Can we get more specific in James 2? Can we answer it more specifically? That's a good question. I just, I, I'm trying to get an umbrella term, faith for daily life, but. Faith for daily life is the, the examples that we gave, or that he gave, uh, faith when we pray for the sick, faith for wisdom when we pray for wisdom, that we believe God's going to hear our prayer, faith uh, in trials, that God's using those trials to help us to grow. Uh, what was the other example? Uh, well, in James 2, is there a specific one like you just listed? Oh, I see Yeah, let's think about that. I, I want to honor our time. We'll pick it up next week. Let's pray.